Hi, this is Robert Godfrey from Moonspring Bee Supply. This is the Beekeeping Today podcast. Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment presented by Better Bee. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flottam. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thank you, Sherry. And a quick shout out to all of our sponsors whose support allows us to bring you this podcast each week without resorting to a fee-based subscription. We don't want that, and we know you don't either. Be sure to check out all of our content on our website. There you can read up on all our guests, Read our blog on the various aspects and observations about beekeeping. Search for, download, and listen to over 200 past episodes. Read episode transcripts, leave comments and feedback on each show, and check on podcast specials from our sponsors. You can find it all at www.beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Hey, thanks for joining, and a big thanks to Robert Godfrey for that opening. You know, folks, you too can help open a show by recording your greeting on your phone and sending it to us here. It's simple, and and it actually is easy to do. Of course, you can also track me down at an upcoming conference, and I will record your greeting right there on the spot. Now, what could be easier? And Becky, speaking of easy, I bet you have an easy weekend all set. Oh, Absolutely. I don't have to fight the the muddy tracks to my bee yard or anything like that. It's been raining here nonstop for a couple of days and I need to get to my bees. Mm. So I hope that I don't get stuck. But uh, I'm looking to right now, it, it's time in Minnesota where we stop feeding. So mm-hmm. I'm going to take off those feeders. And also it's not quite time to button them up for winter, but I like to put a moisture board on top mm. uh, around this time of year. A bunch of top, a lot of questions there for you. So uh, <laughs> are, are your, is your, we've not talked about this. Is your bee yard, like not in your backyard, obviously, is it out in the field? Is it, do you have to drive onto property to get to them? Jeff, I have six bee yards. And so every one of them has, has a different plan of access. <laughs> <laughs> and ask me if I've ever gotten stuck at any of them. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like maybe you have. <laughs> I have, I have. Uh, luckily, luckily, the one I got stuck with, the farmer was ready to, to pull me out of the mud. But, um, and I have, I have four wheel drive too, but I, it's still, it can get pretty muddy, especially yeah. when we get, we've gotten so much rain. Sure. I, all of my bee yards are within really 45 minutes of where I live. Mm-hmm. And one of them is as close as five minutes away. And then a couple, like I said, are, are a little bit more of a drive. So you're, you're, you were feeding a uh, sugar syrup then? Yeah. And you're so going to pull I, that, those feeders off? Yep. I, I probably had to feed about, uh, probably about fifty percent of my hives this year. I in Minnesota we do something that's a little different from the rest of the world. We actually keep them in three deeps, mm. and so which which a lot of people are now doing the math and saying that's about sixty pounds of wasted honey right there. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. but it's it's a, a nice system. If sometimes if you just don't have to worry about feeding. But I had a lot of I had a a few colonies that I I was nursing along a little bit. They started small this year and and they're they're doing okay, but I just a little insurance, so I've been feeding some of them. Oh, very good. And and so this is a, a common uh misconception for many, especially newer beekeepers in the fall feeding and, and we're getting towards the end and people should be wrapping up their feeding, but what what proportion to sugar to water do you feed in the fall? Oh, that's a good question. It's a two to one proportion yeah. or it's however much I can dissolve in warm water using so my So three arm. to one even would be it's, it's, it's pr- really it's, thick. It's pr- 
Right, right. I'm, it, it, for sure, it's a thick syrup. Um, mm-hmm. I think when I was at the university, it was we had actually a, a mark on the bucket. And mm-hmm. in the field, when I'm mixing syrup, I'm not as precise, but it's it's definitely a thick syrup. Yeah. Um, oh, very good. Yeah, you know, and and moving here to Washington State, and folks. I apologize because I always talk about. I've lived here for twenty years, but I always talk about moving here. <laughs> it's funny how time changes. I never dealt with candy boards. But okay. here, candy boards are really popular because of the the atmospheric t- uh, moisture that's in the air. So the candy boards are a way to feed the sugar and also utilize the moisture that's in the hive from the bee's metabolism. And, and so it helps control some of that humidity in the hive through the winter and through the fall as well. So do you do just moisture boards or do you feed with syrup also? Uh, this year, I did not feed with syrup. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'll let you ask me next spring how did that how did that go? How, how uh, this did year, that go? <laughs> yeah. And, and this year I'm I'm working with some fondant, um, mm-hmm. and, and working with fondant as opposed to a candy board because I just don't have the facility to 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 set up and make candy boards. That's, it's a major a process. operation. It's a process that yep. um, I would be kicked out of the house if I tried to do that. So um, I'm not a I'm not a very good handy person. So I I like to buy things. Ready made, yep, and so yep. the fondant ready made to go is good for me. So, oh, that's really interesting, really interesting. So, in with the fondant, are you putting that on? Where are you putting that? Are you putting that below the inner cover? So I try, I, I try to put it under the inner cover. But today's boxes or the today's inner covers aren't like the old inner covers where you, you could flip them and have enough room right. to put a patty. So I have a quilt box that I okay. picked up from a local supplier that has a like a two inch, inch and a half space underneath the quilt area. I take the quilt box. It has a screen cover on it. I lay down a piece of cloth like burlap or an old pillowcase. And then I, on top of that, and that's the kind of retain moisture in my warped brain and, and then put the insulation and then put the top of the hive. So there's a little gap, an uh, mm-hmm. inch and a half or two inch gap for the, the patties, and then uh, the insulation. And that worked really well last year. Okay. So I'm okay. looking forward to seeing how it works this year. Nice. Long nice. answer are, to your short question. The, well, I'm, I still have questions. I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly, I promise. But so those are, are these two deep hives? These are two deep uh, eight-frame hives, yes. Eight-frame hives. Okay. Okay, interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> well folks, there you go. That's, that's our weekend and uh, in October. And let's get to our guest, Eugene Makovic, who is the editor for American Bee Journal. Uh, you may not know the name or you might barely recognize the name, but there's a beekeeper behind that name and the editor of that magazine. So we'll be talking to Eugene real quick. But first, a quick word from our friends at Strong Microbials. Looking forward to it. Strong Microbials presents an exciting new product, Superfuel the probiotic fondant that serves as nectar on demand for our honeybees. Superfuel is powered by three remarkable bacteria known as bacilli, supporting bees in breaking down complex substances for easy digestion and nutrient absorption. This special energy source provides all the essential amino acids, nutrients, polyphenols, and bioflavonoids, just like natural flower nectar. Vital for the bee's nutrition and overall health, Superfuel is the optimal feed for dearth periods, over winter survival, or whenever supplemental feeding is needed. The big plus is the patties do not get hive beetle larvae, so it offers all bioavailable nutrients without any waste. Visit strongmicrobials.com now to discover more about Superfuel and get your probiotic fondant today. And while you're at the Strong Microbial site, make sure you click on and subscribe to The Hive, the regular newsletter full of interesting beekeeping facts and product updates. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Sitting across the virtual Beekeeping Today podcast table is Editor-in-Chief Eugene Makovic of American Bee Journal. Eugene, welcome to the show. Thanks. And it's just it's just editor. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to try and get a promotion to Editor-in-Chief one of these days. We'll see. <laughs> Beware that you might just get a title instead of an actual. 
Great. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Yeah, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Normally, they give you more responsibility and no more money. Is it was my experience, but I'm editor of American Bee Journal, the ABJ, as as most people call it, has been around since 1861. It's the oldest English language beekeeping publication in the world, as opposed to uh, Bee Culture, which is just, you know, the, the, the younger sibling, they've only been around since 1873 or something <laughs> like that. So, <laughs> but it's it's a really, I love my I love my job. I love working for the Data and Family, and, and they've been around as long as the journal. And so it's, it's, a, it's a nice, it's a nice gig. It definitely shows in the quality of publication you put out. So you can always tell when someone enjoys their job. I know one of your passions for the last couple of years, and you mentioned it last time you were on the show, was the labeling laws for honey in the state of Missouri. And we were talking before we started recording, this is an issue for many states around the country is, as beekeepers deal, in this time of year especially, start dealing with bottling their honey and, and selling their honey and start thinking about that part of beekeeping. The label laws are all different and can be crazy. Let's talk about that. Yeah, and this time of year, like like you said, we, we get a lot of questions through the local club and, and through the state organization and what are my rules for for selling honey and, and a lot of people don't don't know and some of the stores that they're trying to sell through don't know and they, they direct them in the wrong direction and so we're always trying to set people straight and and let them know that we did we did change our law in Missouri in, in two thousand fifteen and that was a kind of a, a personal quest of, of mine. I, I was on the on the wrong end of that regulation at one point, and so I I uh, set about doing something about it. There are a lot of states that all kind of follow the same general rules. It's like somebody came up with this thing years ago, and everybody else copy it, and it basically comes down to honey is classified as a processed food, and if you're if if you're some some states will call it a cottage food, and they'll allow you to sell direct to your consumer. And as long as you put a little label on there, warning people that it's not inspected by the state, you're okay. But the minute you try selling at your your neighborhood feed store or farm store or pharmacy or any other those places that people like to buy local honey, suddenly you've become a food process, and you're subject to commercial kitchen rules or inspected kitchen rules, you know, it's kind of a pain in the neck, you know, and, and me personally, I, I tend to lean a bit libertarian. So anytime there's a government regulating something, I always kind of ask why is there a good reason for this? And, and here was a case where it affected me personally. And, and most of the time, you know, the government regulates a lot of things, you know, governments at all levels. And for the most part, people just, kind of live with it, you know, because it's it's more trouble and more more hassle and more expensive to try and fight it than it is to comply with it. So and then and then when you ask around, everybody else that's like you has been dealing with it too. And it's just it's just a normal course of events. Well it's always been this way. And and so you just comply and you don't think about it. Since you'd worked on changing the law in twenty fifteen has something changed since then, or is it not changed to the degree that's that's suitable to help beekeepers make it easy to bottle and then sell their honey? Are there still changes that you need to make? Where Missouri is concerned, we're pretty happy with it. We've we've kind of gotten gotten what we want. I've been talking to to people, you know, I talked to local clubs about this, about you know what the rules are in Missouri, but I've also talked to some people in in other states, I took, you know, I talked to a group a while back in Florida. I talked to a group in California. California is nobody regulates like the state of California. <laughs> their their rules out there. You've got to you've got to have a license, a cottage food license. You've got to pay something for that license. You have to take a a cottage food training course. You have to repeat that every three years. You cannot sell. Outside the state, you can't sell outside the county without the next county's permission, which is a really a really odd thing. I don't know where that came from, but it's just that you know, there's a lot of a lot of levels there, and apparently that's that's been that way for a while. Now I looked up Minnesota since Becky, since you're in Minnesota, I looked up. You've got some of those requirements up there. You you've got to have a registration apparently, 
We're actually good as long as you don't add anything to the honey. All right. Yeah, I just did a, a quick search today and I got some some bad information then. So that's good. Yeah, it's on the, the Minnesota Department of Ag website. It's one of those things where you kind of have to dig through it to read it. But basically, if they're your hives and it's your honey, then you're fine. If you are packaging it from another beekeeper, then that triggers the license requirement. But you can sell through stores then? Yes. Is there a bottom or is there a threshold that if you're below a certain, and I'm not sure how it's probably different each state, what that threshold would be with this number of pounds or colonies or number of jars that, hey, if I'm only producing 10 jars of honey, I can take it down to my local farm market and sell it without worrying about the regulation. Whereas if I'm doing hundreds of pounds. Not really. I mean, usually if you're selling anything and you're selling it through another location, then you've got to meet those requirements. Now, in the, the exemption that we got, where we don't have to, uh, where we don't have to deal with these things, there's an upper threshold of fifty thousand dollars. Where if I were to sell more than fifty thousand dollars of honey, then I would have to have that whole the inspected kitchen, regardless. And in in that case, I'm probably going to have a, a pretty good facility for that anyway. You know, the the larger the larger producers. Now, what where we used to be. There was a thirty thousand dollar requirement where even if you, even if you were you were doing just the, the selling, you know, at farmers markets or whatnot, or direct to consumer, if you sold more than fifty, more than thirty thousand dollars, you needed the kitchen regardless. Now we've moved that. Now we've moved that up to thirty thousand for, for anybody, or up to fifty thousand rather for anybody. But now when when this first came along with with me. I'd been a beekeeper for about 15 years. I I lived in St. Louis County. I live in Lincoln County now, Missouri, about an hour northwest of St. Louis. So I spent the first 15 years of my beekeeping career in St. Louis County, which generally speaking is a lot more regulated than than we are out here. I mean, as far as I knew, Lincoln County was the place you go to get away from regulations. You know, <laughs> your your old fridge craps out, you drag it to the yard and use it for parts, and and it sits out there. <laughs> you, know? you know, the nice thing about living in a in a county like this is you can pretty much do whatever you want on your own property. The downsize is so can your neighbors, but you know, it's it's everything's a trade off, <laughs> right? So anyway, I moved out here, put put honey in a couple of the local stores, and. I got a call one day from a county inspector saying I, I pulled your honey off the shelves up here at Brown's Meat Market, and because I, I have no record of you having an inspected kitchen, and I said, "Well, what's that all about?" And I said, "I didn't. I wasn't aware Lincoln County had those kind of rules." And she said, "This isn't. This isn't us. This is the state health department coming down to the county level, saying we need to start enforcing this law on beekeepers." So I went round and round with her about, you know, what it entailed. And she told me about the direct sales versus versus indirect sales. And and I I was asked, I kept asking her, what's the difference? It's the same honey. What's the, what does it matter if I'm selling it to to Joe and he's selling it to Susan versus me just selling it direct to Susan? It's the same honey. And she said, Well, that's just the way it is. And and I asked her about the law. What you know, can you at least give me the law and I can and I can look it up? And she didn't know. But she said, I'll, I'll, I don't know what the statute is. I'll put you in touch with the state inspector. So she gave me inf- the contact information for this woman, Virginia. And I, I called her and then I called her again. It was several days before she got back to me. But finally heard from her and kind of went through the same questions. And between the direct versus indirect and the fact that even if I'm selling direct to you, I have to have a little warning label on there saying this product is not inspected by the Department of Health and Human Services or Health and Senior Services, which, you know, try fitting that on one of your small honey, <laughs> honey labels. It's not an easy thing anyway, especially for something that shouldn't be necessary. So I, I was getting a little bit annoyed at the whole thing and and annoyed with the fact that I just wasn't getting any amount of understanding or empathy from from either of these inspectors. And I don't know, I, I kind of got a chip on my shoulder. And we had Virginia come to our Missouri State Beekeepers meeting. This was in, I think this was in August that I that this first happened. And in 14, 
she came to our Missouri Beekeepers Conference in October to discuss this and explain this to her and to us. And she had a, a, a PowerPoint presentation. She got about five slides in and gave up because there were so many questions and challenges. And I mean, it went on for about 45 minutes. And so it was, it was, it was an eye opener for her, I think, but also for us, because most of us didn't, had never heard of, of this, of this rule. And we had another, we, we had actually had her scheduled to talk to our local club, Three Rivers Beekeepers, of which I was president at the time. And she didn't make it because she had her daughter was sick. But when she didn't show up, there was another person that had come in who had who had been her her predecessor in that job. And so he offered to get up and ex- explain some things. And and we had a good back and forth. And, and one thing he told us was, you're not going to get anywhere with the health department. If you want to change this, you're going to have to go through the legislature. We set about doing that. And it took a while. I mean, it, it was a, it turned out to be a complicated process. Did you find somebody to sponsor a bill? It was a statute that was changed? Yes, yes. So we were we were part of what was called the Jams and Jellies Law. And I don't know, you know, why we were in there, but we were. And it was it was the end of 2014 and it was right after the election when we started looking at this. And and my local rep was was between jobs. She had she had just got elected from representative to the state senate. So I couldn't get a hold of her at either place. I had people telling me, "Well, we need to get a lobbyist," and I said, "We're not. We're not going to get a lobbyist, but, but we're not, you know we're going to try and get a hold of somebody." So finally, I ran into somebody who knew this, this now state senator Jeannie Riddle, or knew her legislative aide, and he put me in touch, and and so we sat down with with them. I sat down with them and 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 my other beekeeper friend who who knew him, and told her what was going on and, and what we thought we needed changed. And she said, yeah, we should be able to do that. And meantime, I, we had also at the state or at the local level, we had sent a letter to the Missouri Health Department saying, please tell us, you know, how many, how many cases that you have of people getting sick from eating honey, especially since they hadn't been enforcing that rule up to that time. And we figured, you know, they probably won't respond, but if it comes to it, you know, in the legislature would just say, look, they wouldn't even talk to us, right? So on the morning of my meeting with Senator Riddle, I got a letter back from them stating that we checked and there, we don't, we have no record of anyone ever getting sick from eating honey in the state of Missouri. So I showed that to Senator Riddle and she said, this is going to be helpful. From, from there, it was a matter of sitting down and, and hashing out basically what, what they thought we could get past what I thought beekeepers could live with. You know, we wanted to get rid of the commercial kitchen regulation, that little warning label. And I was hoping to also get rid of that that monetary threshold of $30,000. Because there again, I, my, my question was, what's the difference between the $29,000 honey and the $31,000 honey? It's, there's an arbitrary number there. I'm surprised that someone didn't try to use the fact that no one had been sick in the state of Missouri due to honey as proof that the law was working. That would be the logic, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, except for the fact that they had not been enforcing that law until <laughs> until that, that till year. Until the, they saw they, your honey like, on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody got the bright idea that we need to start cracking down on these beekeepers because they're endangering the public health or something. Let's take this opportunity to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Elevate your beekeeping knowledge with Better Bee's free monthly newsletter, The Better Bee Buzz. Get the buzz on seasonal beekeeping tips and education designed to make you a beekeeping superstar. Don't miss out. Sign up today at betterbee.com forward slash sign up and become part of our buzzing community. Happy beekeeping adventures await. Better Bee. Your source for beekeeping success. So you talked to the senator and you got the senator's support. What were the next steps? What did you have to do? So another another interesting thing, though, in, in the process was that I, I was on the I was on the board of the Missouri State Beekeepers because I was doing the, the newsletter, and I brought this to a board meeting and 
And there was a little concern there that if we pushed forward on it and we failed, that the health department might actually get aggravated with us and crack down harder. And there was also some some members that thought, well, it's, it's probably too late to do something this year because this was in January at that point. The session runs from January to May, mid-May and a lot of bills get pre-filed by December and there's a whole pile up of bills always and a lot of them don't get through. So one of the nice things that, you know, talking to, to Senator Riddle was she said, we've got time to do this because it's a fairly simple issue. But she kept going back and I, I was talking about the label requirement, for example, and she kept saying things like, yeah, I don't know if we any way we, that we complicate this is going to decrease our chances. That, you know, of, of it's going to increase our chances of getting some pushback. And and I said, so who do you think will be opposed to this? And and she said, oh, urban and suburban legislators. And and she was surprised when I told her that most beekeepers nowadays are in those urban and suburban <laughs> districts. So kind of I kind of let you know kind of settled her down on that. And then she asked me, she said, we need to be able to demonstrate that the beekeepers of Missouri want this. And it's not just some disgruntled guy in my district who's got <laughs> a bone to pick with the health department. You know, so, you so I said, yeah, well, well give, give me the bill as it's written up and I will run it back by the board. And so the MSBA board approved that wording unanimously and we moved forward. And then it was just a matter of, of getting it through the legislature, which there's that saying that you don't want to see how the sausage is made. It, it, it gets very complicated. And the great thing about it was there was no opposition from in the legislature. I mean, we testified in committees. The questions that we got were things like, well, isn't honey like the perfect food? And I heard that it never spoils. And, you know, so they were all they were all on our side. So it was a it was a really neat thing. We just got bogged down in the process and it got interesting in the last week because there were we, we actually passed companion bills, one in the House, one in the Senate, that were identical. They both passed easily, two votes against on both sides, and then one of them had to make it through the other side. And one of them, so we had a House bill in the Senate and, and vice versa. Well, the last week of the session, the Senate shut down for a filibuster. The, the Republicans had control. They were pat, wanted to pass a right-to-work bill. Democrats were dead set against it. They said, we know you have the votes, but if you do that, we're going to filibuster everything from the morning prayer to the end of every day. And so the, they passed the bill, the Senate shut down. And so then we were on the, on the House side, we had three days to go. And there was a, a scandal between the Kansas City Star published a story on Tuesday night. You know, the sessions were ending on Friday. They published a story about the House Speaker having a dalliance with a college intern and the, the house shut down the speaker resigned they opened back up friday morning elected a new speaker said we're gonna we got back in session friday afternoon we're gonna pass some bills and we were one of 32 bills that they pushed through out of hundreds that were still in the pile there so it really went down to the wire and you know it was very a very stressful thing and it was also happened to be my, I was getting married about two weeks after that. So <laughs> the bad news for, for my wife is I wasn't a whole lot of help. <laughs> the, the good news for me was I wasn't a whole lot of help. <laughs> so, but we, we got it done and, and then the gov- governor ended up signing it. But this, this is something, like I was saying, there's a, a lot of states that, that are, that are struggling with this. We have, Occasionally, you hear of one that's that's doing something. And when this whole thing first came up, I I wrote about it in the in the news, the Missouri newsletter. Both ABJ and B Culture advertise in the newsletter, so they both get copies of it. Well, Joe Graham emailed me from from he was the editor of American Beer, Beer Journal at the time. He emailed me and he asked for permission to reprint my article. And then he also said, "I want to tell you what Illinois did." A, a year or two ago to fix this problem. What what they did was they pulled honey out of the purview of the health department and they gave it to the ag department. And Illinois is a, a completely different world from Missouri in terms of, of bees and beekeeping. We're like the Wild West over here. Illinois is when you, 
if you're a beekeeper in Illinois, you have to register your hives. You have to submit to inspection once a year, and which you know I wouldn't you know be real happy about probably. But the, the upside is that they've got a very active program over there. They've got the university, the you know Gene Robinson and May Berenbaum and those people over there. They've got at the U of I. It, there's a lot of good honey research, honeybee research comes out of there. And the ag department is very much involved in, in beekeeping. The local bee clubs are affiliated with the state organization, which is in turn affiliated with the ag department. So when they ran into this problem over there, the ag department helped them go to the legislature and change this and just pulled it out of the health department's hands and turned honey from being a processed food to an agricultural commodity and pulled pulled the regulations off of it. They they set a threshold of 500 gallons where if you produced if you sold more than 500 gallons, you then had to have that kitchen. But otherwise, you're free and clear, and you can sell wherever you want. So I I really took hope from that at the start because you know Illinois is not a state that I think of as being one where you can reduce regulations. So I thought if, if Illinois can do it, we can do it over here. It would be really interesting to get a tally of each state and what their rules are. And it also makes just the argument for, I bet there are beekeepers siloed in different states who are working with these regulations to try to change the regulations to make them more favorable and to make them represent the actual properties of honey. It would be it would be really interesting to get a, a tally on that and also to give those those states some support. My guess would be that there's probably more beekeepers who don't know or are unaware of what's required than those who are aware and trying to comply or blatantly just ignoring it. Yeah. And and I think that's a lot of it. A lot of it just gets ignored and, and not enforced. And it hadn't been enforced in Missouri until that point. And a lot of people just kind of get used to that's the way things are. You know, whenever I whenever I read a story somewhere about, you know, in, in magazines or online or whatever, about how how you go about preparing your honey and, you know, extracting and bottling things, they tend to throw that thing in about and just remember that you have to, you're not allowed to sell through stores unless you do this in a commercial kitchen and all this. And, it, and it's just in there. It's just a, it's just a part of life. And and people just realize, you know, they, they just know that that's something that they have to deal with. And, and nobody really thinks about it beyond that other than, well, I can only sell person to person. But every now and then a state does something. New Jersey just passed, the, they, they got out from under this this last year. Their state organization got behind this in 21 and they, and they got a bill through their legislature unanimously on both sides and the governor vetoed it. And, and it was actually, it was a, what's called a pocket veto where and this varies by state, but if in, in New Jersey's case, you have, if, if you pass the law, then it's up to the governor, of course, to sign it or veto it. If it's passed at the end of the session, he can just sit on it and ignore it and let it die if he doesn't do anything with it. So, and which is, to me, that's worse than a, a, a real veto. You know, at least, at least you got to take a stand if you're vetoing something, but Pocket veto was more like these people aren't even worth my time. You know? <laughs> so then they did the same thing again in 22, and they passed it earlier in the session to where I think it was like a 45 day limit to how long he could sit on it before he made a decision on it. And the uh, governor actually went out of town toward the end of the session, and so did the lieutenant governor, which put the third in command, the Senate president in as acting governor and he sat in that chair and he signed a bunch of bills that the governor was <laughs> ignoring. So, so they got it through that way. So it's, you know, whatever it takes, right? But I'm always amazed that there aren't more of the state beekeeping organizations that are making a real push to get these things changed because you can see how in, in both Missouri and, and New Jersey, there was no opposition in the legislature. We're, basically loved and, and beekeepers, bees and beekeepers are loved throughout the country now. People have a lot more respect for us than they did, you know, before CCD and all that put us in the news all the time. And it's as far as the actual 
convincing people, it's a it's a slam dunk. It's just a matter of somebody going through that process. And in my case, I was just the guy that put took it personally at the time and and I had a job that where I was kind of I was fairly flexible at the time. My boss was good about letting me take off on a day's notice to go to Jeff City and and do this sort of thing. So that's really all it takes is somebody to be able to do it. And, and it's not that difficult. So beekeeping organization presidents need to put it on their winter to-do list to check the laws, share them with their organization members, and then possibly change them if there there's some roadblocks, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I wonder if the National Honey Board, I know they're really interested in supporting beekeepers in marketing honey. And I know they have USDA funding and it's federal, but I, I wonder if there's something that they could do as far as supporting beekeepers and giving them support for changing laws. Yeah, I really haven't uh, contacted anyone there about it, but that's a great idea. Yeah, they, they really do want to get more local honey on the shelves. And I've, I know I've talked to a couple of people from the National Honey Board and they've been really supportive. So it's it's an idea as far as maybe getting all the beekeepers on the same page and and having their support. One thing that surprised me during and after this process was that there was, there I actually got a little bit of pushback from a couple of people. First of all, there was a, there was a commercial beekeeper in Missouri that pushed back on it in part because, well, for one thing, because we couldn't get rid of that upper threshold and he thought it was unfair to the larger producers that the the little guys like me would be able to sell through local stores without having to, I guess, spend the money he had to spend to get that whole commercial kitchen and everything. But I had, I I posted a couple things on an online forum about this when we got it passed and that had a couple of people push back that were larger, larger beekeepers. And there was a honey inspector that pushed back or a, a bee inspector from another state, basically saying that we were going to destroy the industry, destroy our reputation by allowing every Tom, Dick and Harry to sell their honey that was produced, you know, God knows how and in dirty bottles and, and, and whatnot. And, you know, which really kind of took me, kind of caught me off guard. I remember reading somewhere from another guy at one point, another larger scale beekeeping keep beekeeper said one time that and he was in the Kansas City area, he said that every time I see some upstart competitor's honey on the on the supermarket shelves next to mine, I call my buddy at the health department and a couple of weeks later that honey's not there. Oh anymore. no. So <laughs> that's not the story. So it's one of those, you know. It's one of those gatekeeping things, you know, I think for some people there, but I get, you know, I, I can see the the point where if you've had to spend all that money, that that would be something you wouldn't want somebody else coming in and undercutting you on price because they didn't have that, that overhead. But that was another another part of, of, of our argument in the, legis- in the legislature was the tremendous amount of money that it's going to cost to to build this kitchen. We're you know, we one of the one of the people that testified with us talked about having to go through this and spend twenty thousand dollars getting getting up to the standards of of her county, and, and it varied by county too, and and local. Everybody has a little bit different rules on that, so it's kind of a guessing game until you actually do it. Besides Google, <laughs> where would you suggest someone start? investigating their state about these requirements? What search terms would you use? What's the starting point? That's a good question because I mentioned at the outset that I looked up Minnesota's laws and, and I, I didn't get the right information. In fact, I you, I could look up Missouri's laws and sometimes find the top thing that'll come up will be the, the law that as it used to exist. So I can understand how, how there's how there's there's confusion because the web pages don't go away. You know they're out there forever unless you find the most recent one. But I think that the state your state honey or state beekeeping association usually has got got that information on what the laws are. It's on our Minnesota extension in in our state. So or our, at least the Bee Lab website, the Minnesota Bee Lab website. They have a link for the labeling. 
requirements. And then also for the, we're under cottage food law, but we're exempt, if that makes sense. That's where it's, that's where it falls. So a beekeeper listening to the podcast would have to do a little digging and then verify the information that you find to know that you're in the right place. So I wouldn't necessarily rely totally on what you receive on a listserv or a bulletin board or Facebook or something like that. I would I would do a little bit digging and find the regulations where food and honey comes in for your state laws and regulations, I think would be one of the safer bets. And of course, you could ask your local health department, but there again, if you're, if they're not enforcing it, not, if there is a law that they're not enforcing, that might think, get them thinking, hey, you know. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> Hello. Right. My name is Jack Smith. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. Same when people ask about, is it is it legal to keep beekeeping in my, to keep bees in my suburb? And who do I ask? Do you really want to go ask the city or do you want to... <laughs> Ask for, what is it? Ask forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> Ask for forgiveness? Oh boy, we're going to get all sorts of people in trouble. <laughs> <But> no, <laughs> I always, yeah, no, we always tell people that that's a local level. The best thing you can do is ask. Ask the local authorities because there again, a lot of a lot of cities have those regulations online, but finding them in the right place is not always easy. But the other problem with these with these state rules that we had is, and one of my, another one of my arguments is that you're you're basically picking on the beekeepers of your state because I have to put that for one thing if 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 I'm allowed to put it on on there then I have to have that label on there saying not inspected or whatever whereas you you can bring in honey from surrounding states and it's not subject to that Missouri law so so you're basically or or worse yet from from outside the country you know so the the, the the onus is on the Missouri beekeeper versus the Illinois beekeeper or even the Chinese beekeeper. So you're kind of punishing your own your own people. After I got this thing passed, after we got it through, and, and I, I did a follow-up article for ABJ, and actually Kim Flodham asked me to write one for Bee Culture as well. And after those published, I got a call from a guy in Arkansas. He said, I, I live in Arkansas right across from the Missouri border. I run 80 to 100 hives, give or take, on both sides. And up until now, I've been selling my Arkansas honey in Missouri, my Missouri honey in Arkansas, just to get along around these goofy regulations. <laughs> now, he said, thanks to this new law, I can legally sell my Missouri honey in Missouri. <laughs> but you still got Arkansas with the old laws. Kansas has got the old laws. That's why I think people choose to be ignorant of the law as opposed to trying to actually research it. But I think it's better to research it. I think a lot of it just this happens. It's good to research it and do it right, especially because I think our market for honey in grocery stores, local honey in grocery stores is increasing. And so if you're going to do all the work to get yourself into a grocery store, it makes sense to make sure that you don't have any roadblocks like you experienced, Eugene. One of the things that this inspector what, that was pushing back against me said was that you're going to, you have to worry about now about anybody who's just going to adulterate honey in their home kitchen and whatnot. And and I said, okay, so who's going to be more likely to adulterate honey? The, the person who's selling in his local store and talking to the owner, maybe chatting with the customers walking in the door or the person who's selling it in from out of state on a truck that has never, never met anyone that's that's in your local community. That, that doesn't that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And as far as the, the same thing with dirty bottles and whatnot, that the market will take care of that pretty quickly. If if you're selling honey that's poorly labeled and and smudged bottles and things like that, you're not. I'm not going to buy that honey. I'm going to buy the nicer looking one next to it. What do you think the impact of, and this is kind of out of left field, right field, the impact of all the artificial honeys, the the bio honeys that are coming out? This is probably not even in the same subject, but I would think that enters in somehow, or does it just muddy the waters? Maybe it doesn't do anything. I think it muddies a, a little bit. You're talking about the new plant-based honey that's extracted from plants and, and whatever product, yeah. Using enzymes 
such as where NB got, but not produced by bees. <laughs> Something. I think it might muddy the water for some people. I don't think to a whole degree. I mean, it's it's kind of maddening to to read that and, and hear the rationale behind it. And because they base it on bees being poorly treated and 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 bad for the environment, honeybee, you know, that they claim that honeybees are crowding out all the other native bees, which, as we know, that's 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 not settled science by any means and there, there are arguments for and against and and you can you can certainly flood an area with enough bees that you're gonna you're gonna harm you know out outrun the forage for both honeybees and and native bees but that's not the norm i think that's for most most beekeepers aren't, aren't dealing with that or doing that but i think i think for most people buying honey they know they're going to know the difference and Asking a beekeeper, and they'll tell you that uh, people like their backyard honey far better than anything they found in the store, and that's just because the personal, personal touch, and plus it does taste better. So, Eugene, this has really been educational. The whole topic of labeling and laws regarding honey is an important subject, and I'm I'm glad you brought it to us, and it's, it's something I'd like to keep exploring. Maybe we can have you back, and as we learn more about labeling laws and requirements in other parts of the country, you can come back and comment and maybe provide some feedback for our listeners. Your personal struggle is is great information and inspiration for all the beekeepers out there. You know, we've been talking about the label laws and a little bit about ABJ. Anything that you'd like to talk about that we hadn't brought up before we let you go for the afternoon? That mellow bio thing you, you mentioned is is worth is worth talking about. I, I think that we kind of went through a push there for a while where everybody thought the bees are dying. And, you know, it seemed like everybody was, was going to the extreme end thinking bees were an endangered species and we had to save the bees and everything. And now it's kind of swung the other direction with some of the environmental groups that are pushing back against honeybees saying, we've been worrying about the wrong species there's nothing wrong with honeybees. In fact, they're invasive here and they're crowding out the natives. And <laughs> I think we're, we're going to have to worry a little bit about kind of having to defend ourselves a, a little against against those types of, of stories. Whereas before they were almost being too nice to us. Now they're, we're yesterday's news more or less than yes, or yesterday's darling. And that, that kind of leaves us open. Yeah, the focus needs to be changed to more flowers. Honey production overall in the country is down 50% since 87. I honestly, there's an argument out there that it's it's not one bee versus the other. It's the fact that we need more habitat for all the bees and pollinators out there. Yeah, I tell people all the time, I've got typically half a dozen hives of bees in my yard, eight of them right now. I've got hundreds of thousands of foragers heading out of those hives going God knows where because I don't see them in my yard for the most part. <laughs> I look around the yard and in my garden and all the things we've got planted and the wildflowers in the area and I'm finding all kinds of other natives out there and, and the occasional honeybee. I, I know when say the clovers dried up or that you know when the when the major nectar flows are are shut down coming into these hot summer months. I know when they hit that spot because I start seeing honeybees in my own yard working all the little things that they were ignoring before because they're because they're desperate. But by and large, I know I'm not crowding out <laughs> any native any native pollinators of any of any sort. And I think that in the in most almost all cases, beekeepers are not doing that. Certainly, if you're a commercial beekeeper and you're plunking down 80, 80 hives somewhere in an area over a couple of months' time, they're going to overrun that forage in that area. But that's, again, that's, that's not the norm. Not necessarily. There are, there's some really good studies in North Dakota where the honeybees thrive, so do the native bees. So I think that with all that competition data out there, it actually does exist where if your bees are, are making honey, there are data that show other bees are rich in species and they're also definitely thriving. So that's why we just have to keep driving home. More flowers, more honey, more bees, good for everybody. 
specific research is generalized for everything. So it might be true for one instance in one very narrow study, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's inclusive across the country in every habitat. Yeah, there was one study that was the Canary Islands, which is obviously a kind of an isolated, isolated By area. definition. <laughs> yeah. An island in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, all right. Yeah, but and there have also been studies that show that, yeah, the honeybees, given the uh, population, they, they perform more pollination in that area, which causes more seed set and more flowers the following season. And it's that old rising tide lifts all boats thing. So it depends on where you're looking, I guess. Well, Eugene, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show today. And thanks for joining Becky and me. And I know Kim will be sorry that he missed you. We'll get you back on when he's back on with us. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me. You bet. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Eugene. I'll be honest, Becky, I don't know what the laws are here in Washington state. In Colorado, I sold all of my honey to a local packer, so I didn't even bother ever looking it up. And I remember in Ohio, they changed the laws when I was a beekeeper there where everyone was worried that the state inspector was going to come in and inspect everyone's kitchen or wherever they extracted honey. So this is a good topic, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. It's very timely, and I just I appreciate Eugene's honesty. And also, he shared it's a struggle to get those laws changed, and what it almost cost him his wedding. <laughs> so, <laughs> but but it is it is something that I think you want to be on the right side of if you're investing money into your operation. You know, if if you're if you're trying to expand your market, you just don't want to have to play catch up with the bottling and the labeling laws, because you could invest a lot of, of money in something that you have to redo. When you start talking about, like you said, as you referred to, if you have your own label made or designed and, and put out and go through the print, and then there's a minimum order of labels you have to have printed, especially on a custom label, it's an investment. And I admit, I read the Minnesota laws, especially the label laws, and I don't want to use the word random, but there's a lot of talk about how big the font is and you know what actually needs to be on it. And it it does you do have to pay attention if if you want to fall within their guidelines. I guess the best advice is to make sure you do some research. Start with your state beekeeping organization. That would be a good place to start and then work from there to find out what you need in your state. And then, as we heard from Eugene, it may depend on your county as well. Yep, good advice. And that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on the reviews along the top of any web page. We want to thank our regular episode sponsors, Global Patties, Strong Microbials, and especially Better Bee for their longtime support of this podcast. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their generous support. Finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to leave us questions or comments at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.